This video is brought to you by the work of Tyler Greenfield and his blog Insert Acetus. Make sure you follow him on Twitter and check out his blog with the link in the description and comment section below. The cephalopods are an extremely diverse and long-lasting class of invertebrate animals. They have been around, in some form or another, since at least the late Cambrian, 500 million some odd years ago. Though they rose to prominence in the world's oceans during the Ordovician period, 484.4 to 443.8 million years ago. In that time, they have developed into almost impossible shapes, sizes, colors, and textures, with and without shells. One of the biggest groups of these cephalopods is the nautiloids, which evolutionarily diverged from the rest of the cephalopod gang in the late Cambrian. Now, one of those cephalopod groups, the orthoceratoidea, the straight-shelled nautiloids, became one of the largest groups of predators in the world's oceans during the Ordovician, as mentioned earlier. These guys left behind enormous cone-shaped shells, but little to no soft tissues. So, how do we reconstruct these behemoths? Behemoths that may have stretched up to 20 feet 6 meters with shaky reports of some up to 30 feet 9 meters. The scientifically valid monophyletic grouping we want to be specific with here is the Endoceratoidea and its subgroup, the Endocerida, as we will be taking a look at its best example, Endoceros. The orthoceratoid, Endoceros, is both the longest extinct cephalopod and largest Paleozoic invertebrate. A shell of Endoceros giganteum from the late Ordovician of New York is the current record-holding specimen. As preserved, it measures 3 meters, 9.8 feet in length, with an estimated complete length of 5.73 meters, 19 feet. There is even an anecdotal report of a 9.14 meter, 30 foot shell that was destroyed in the field. As Tyler Greenfield wrote, despite its impressive size, Endoceros is not particularly well represented in Paleoart. The few depictions are plagued by the lack of research found in most art of extinct cephalopods. By incorporating data from both orthoceratoids and the living nautiluses, Greenfield attempted a more rigorous restoration. He followed the classification scheme for nautiluses and relatives proposed by the 2019 work of Andy King and David Evans. He also used the dichotomy of palcephalopoda, all cephalopods closer to living nautiluses, and neocephalopoda, all cephalopods closer to living colloids, your squids, octopuses, and cuttlefish, proposed by Ulrich Lehmann and G. Hilmer in the early 1980s. This turned out to be outdated shortly after Tyler wrote it with the 2022 work of Alexander Pohl and colleagues, which proposed a new phylogenetic analysis of early Paleozoic cephalopods, finding that Paul's cephalopoda is paraphyletic and orthoceratoidea, as traditionally conceived, including endocerida, is polyphyletic. Therefore, endoceratoidea is now considered the sister group to multiceratoidea, which may include living nautiluses, in which case it would be renamed nautiloidea. Endoceratoidea plus multiceratoidea is in turn the sister group to orthoceratoidea, which includes neocephalopoda. As a result, the classification scheme used in Tyler's post and which I tertiarily report on is now outdated. However, the conclusions about endocerid soft tissues reached by Greenfield still stand given they are still related to nautiluses and orthocerids. While no soft tissues from endocerids are known, some exceptional fossils from relatives give insight into how it would have looked. This tends to be the case for most extinct cephalopods, whether they have shells or not, because they have no bones and are thus very rarely preserved in the fossil record. Some slip through in very special circumstances and those help widen the lens of the past, but are often also lacking in the narrow details needed to have a perfectly clear image. In particular, two trace fossils from the late Ordovician of Ohio assigned to the orthocerid Treptoceros may be used to reconstruct the arm crown. 
These impressions, which represent the animal resting or feeding on the seafloor, indicate 10 arms of roughly equal length. Although only traces, they can be confidently referred to as orthocerid since no other contemporary organism matches their morphology, and they occur in the same strata as the shell trails of more definite orthoceratoids. They conform with the ten-armed ancestral condition hypothesized for cephalopods and with the development of nautiluses. You see, adult nautiluses have around 90 small arms, but they all originate from ten-arm buds in the embryonic stage. These trace fossils were later given their own ichnogenus slash species, Phasiphodenia flowerei, by Richard Osgood in 1970. Osgood reinterpreted them as being burrows, but Tyler Greenfield is skeptical of this considering how well they match the hypothesized arm crown of orthoceratoids. Joe Moisiuk recently discovered an additional Phasiphodina from the Georgian Bay Formation of Toronto, Canada. Interestingly, this formation is roughly coeval with Coryville Formation in Ohio, where the original Phasivodina are found, and the orthoceratoid fauna is similarly dominated by Treptoceros. Exactly what implications this has is yet unknown, but new fossils like this could settle the true affinity of Phasivodina. There is another report of a specimen of the orthocerid Michelinoceros from the late Silurian of Bolivia with two arm imprints which were identified as tentacles. However, this is dubious because the other arms are not preserved for comparison. Tentacles are only found in living Decabrachians and the other more complete orthocerid impressions lack them. Additionally, it is uncertain if they are actually the remains of arms or instead a taphonomic artifact. Thus, it remains likely that orthoceratoids, including endocerus, had ten arms without a pair differentiated into tentacles. The adhesive structures on the undersides of the arms are a matter of speculation. The recent discovery of Decabrachian-like arm hooks in ominoids means they may have had suckers like colloids, which in turn would imply that suckers evolved in the Neocephalopoda. Nautiluses, on the other hand, have ridges on their arms that secrete a strong glue. Using phylogenetic bracketing suggests other palcephalopods, including orthoceratoids, had adhesive ridges too. Presumably, the ridges would have been larger on the more well-developed arms of orthoceratoids to aid in prey capture. After all, these things were more closely related to the living nautilus than they were to any other living cephalopod group. The available data on the arms of orthoceratoids therefore contradicts the filter-feeding ecology hypothesized for endocerids by the 2020 work of Alexander Mironenko. The only confirmed filter-feeding cephalopod, the vampire squid, Vampyrotuthis infernalis, uses velar filaments, a modified arm pair, in combination with suckers and ciri for feeding. In other words, they are extremely weird and extremely adapted to their specific dietary habits. If this were the case in other groups of cephalopods, one would expect to see not only these traits, but other traits more akin to those seen on other parts of the vampire squid's bodies. As evidenced by the trace fossils, orthoceratoids did not have an arm pair modified into tentacles or filaments. Suckers are only known in colloids and ciri in octobrachians, so it is unlikely that orthoceratoids would have possessed either. Predating and scavenging on benthic prey is a more plausible ecological niche for endocerids, especially of the biggest ones. Having said that and read this from Tyler's article, I would not be surprised if there were abyssal orthoceratoids that maybe convergently evolved some vampire squid features. That would certainly not be the norm, nor would evidence of this be particularly forthcoming. In other words, I'm being entirely hypothetical. There is direct evidence for endocerid predation on trilobites, which further supports that they were benthic feeders. A bite mark was found on a Pseudogigites latimarginatus, a close relative of Isotulis, from the late Ordovician Lindsay Formation of Ontario. The bite is triangular and best matches the shape of a cephalopod beak. 
It did not break the exoskeleton, but instead deformed the pleural lobes and pygidium. This probably occurred because the exoskeleton was still soft and pliable soon after molting. Although the trilobite initially survived the attack, it died from the injury before it could molt again. Poor bastard. The large endocerids Endocerus proteiformi and Camerocerus trentinensi are present in the Lindsay Formation and are therefore the most likely culprits. There is evidence that all orthoceratoids had an operculum on top of the head, as in nautiluses. They have a little cap, isn't that cute? Unlike the hood-shaped operculum of nautiluses, opercula found with orthocerid shells, referred to the parataxon apticopsis, are relatively flat and oval-shaped. This morphological difference is to accommodate the shape of the shell opening, as the purpose of the operculum is to cover the opening for protection. The homology between nautilus and orthocerid opercula is demonstrated in that they are both composed of three interlocking valves. Apticopsis valves have alternatively been interpreted as jaws by some workers, but this is doubtful considering they do not resemble any other cephalopod jaw types. Like, where would jaws even fit here? Camera-type eyes with lenses are known in colloids, and the presence of colloid-like eye capsules in ammonoids indicates they had them as well. It seems that, like suckers, camera-type eyes evolved in the Neocephalopoda. Racketing would suggest that orthoceratoids and other palcephalopods instead had pinhole-type eyes. If this is the case, it means that Endoceros may have had poor vision, like nautiluses, and relied on other senses for finding prey. This makes the idea of some abyssal orthoceratoids more tantalizing. Preserved color markings are known from a large number of palcephalopods. Note that these do not show the original colors, only the patterns. Markings on a shell of Endostrus proteiformi are described as cancellated by good old O.C. Marsh back in 1869 but unfortunately this specimen was not illustrated and is currently lost. Even though this report is anecdotal, another endocerid, Anthocerus vaginatum, has similar mottled markings, so this coloration is still plausible. Exactly what function it would have served is unknown, with camouflage or mimicry or display being most likely. What with the dazzling colors of the nautiluses and the uber camo of the rest of the cephalopods, I would also not be surprised if this group was capable of all sorts of patterns and colors across the many niches they may have inhabited. A recent study using 3D modeling determined that orthocerids and endocerids maintained a vertical shell orientation while suspended in the water column. This is more evidence against filter feeding, as horizontal movement conducive to filtering would have been restricted. Movement on the seafloor was more varied, with the aforementioned arm impressions showing the shell held vertically, while other trace fossils show movement of the shell horizontally through the sediment. Taken together, the shell orientation and preserved interactions with the seafloor indicate that orthoceratoids were generally benthic feeders. Can you imagine these giants just kind of walking across the seafloor looking for grub? If you disturbed it, it would just shoop into its shell and maybe float off for a bit before coming back to the seafloor. You know how some octopuses have been filmed using two of their limbs as we do and walking across the seafloor? Now graft that behavior onto the giant vertically floating orthocones. What a sight. For more interesting stories about nature, the history of life, or what goes bump in the night, subscribe, like this video, drop a comment in the comment section below, and hit the bell icon to stay in the know with everything Edge. Thanks for watching. Special thanks to Elephant Tier patrons Abby Smith, Arda Bayer, Biotiverse, Cherry Shaw, Chris Frampton, Christoph Hubbinger, Dinosaur, Ed Peretz, Isaiah Garza, Jax the Hacks, Natty Cat, PA Brew News, Ray, Rudy Redgrave, Smiling Walrus, Staniforth Hopkins, Steve Bradshaw, Thea Svensson, and Extraterrestrial as well as my top as tier Tyrannosaurus patrons, Admin, Antron, Aphid Kirby, Cyber, Dana Manchester, Danny Van Heck, Henry Brennan, Iberospinus, Iron Bladesman, Joshua Mana, Panic, 
Radio 404, Robert Kessler, Ruben Zachariah, Swaffles is Weird, Teeny Dragator, and The Dog Man.